Aya, I am an electrician. My name's Jamie Blayton. You're probably an electrician or a trainee and you want to know how to test a motor. I wanted to teach this and I wanted to find a good reference online for it, but there wasn't one. So I've made this video. It's a little bit long. There's a bit of comedy to keep you going, but I assure you, if you are an electrician and you do not get what you want out of testing motors out of this video, call me a rude name in the comments. I also offer consultation, design and train services. So if you want someone to come to your site and show your staff or you how to work and test on motors and bring all the test gear and loads of simulation rigs and motors and everything you can do to do this video with the hands-on feel that you don't get with it, contact me and I'll come and sort you out. I haven't put my contact details here because frankly, if you can't find my contact details, you're not worth my time. Enjoy. You know what it's time for? It's time for a little bit of um, actual electrical content. I'd zoom in there, but I'm hands free, so I'll do that on YouTube. This will be going on YouTube as well. Probably in a better format and more drawings and probably more polished, but I'm gonna put it on Instagram because that's how I record all my videos. So stand by, we're gonna talk about something that people ask me all the time about. So this actual electrical content is gonna be about these. Yeah, this is a motor, a three-phase motor, three-phase synchronous motor. This is, what the one I'm going to use, because this is likely the 99.99% one you're going to come across out in the wild. It's heavy now, so I'm going to put it down into a dog barking outside. Fucking dog. <laughs> Take your fucking stinky little rat dog barking outside my fucking window and fuck it off into a bin. <laughs> so 99% of the motors you're going to come across and they get asked about are these. This is a synchronous AC motor, squirrel cage motor. It's got loads of fucking names, but this particular one is a baby one, hence why I can lift it up. But all the motors you'll like to come across will look like this, function like this in here, and do the same thing as this. I'm just gonna use this one because it's small, but this one could go up to the size of, I don't know, a Ford Fiesta. So I'm gonna bang it on the bench, and I'm gonna go over some stuff. The first thing I'm gonna go over is the most popular thing that anyone's gonna watch this video for, so I'm just gonna stick it at the front so if you're skipping through it, yeah? And that is how to test a three-phase motor. So I'm gonna get that out of the way, so everyone who comes to watch the video could just watch how to test the motor, yeah, and fuck off to wherever, whatever hole they came back from. And if you do want to know more about the casing and all the fucking gubbins that go with it, I'll do that as the video progresses. And if this ends up on YouTube, it will all be menued. On Instagram, you might not see all this on the same day. So yeah, let's have a look at this bastard. Something to be aware of is there are loads of different ways to test a motor. And I'm going to go through a lot of them. And I'm not going to explain all of them, but I'm going to tell you that they're available to you, yeah? The problem half the time is, even though I've been testing motors for the best part of 20 years, is if I'm changing a little motor like that, they're 300 quid. And a big one that's the size of a Ford Fiesta, which I might try and interject a picture of here, you're talking tens of thousands of pounds for a motor, and someone's asking you to tell you what's wrong with it. So it's no just going, it's fucked, like a tiddly one like that. That dog's outside again. Um, there's no good just having a tiddly one like that and just binning motors off, like they, like they don't cost anything, yeah? They're expensive bits of kit. So if you go around all your life doing crap testing the motors and binning them, and they're small, then one day you get asked to test a bigger one, you're going to be up shit street. Because if you're asked to test a motor that's the size of a Ford Fiesta, that needs 20 grand worth of crane iron to get it out of the building, and then a 20 grand replacement, and you say it's fucked, it's not, you're going to look like a massive penis. So because I'm starting off with how to test a motor, because that's undoubtedly why most people are here, I'm going to go over the basic test for a motor. But to go over the basic test for a motor, I'm just going to show you the basic bits of motor you need to know to test it, yeah? Be aware as well, as I previously mentioned, even if it's a little motor like the one that's sat in front of me now, it might be an absolute bastard to get out. It might be an absolute bastard to get out. It might be stuck under some machine, rattled in somewhere, and you might expel three or four days of effort trying to get a motor that's been in there 20 years out. So when you say it's knackered, if when it comes out it's not knackered, you're gonna look very silly. So something I'd always do is, I'd always look for a second opinion, even though I've been doing it a very long time. I do them a test and go, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's down to earth or whatever on phase number one. And then I'll probably get someone who knows what they're doing as well and get them just to give me the, the warm and fuzzies by going, yeah, I think you're right, yeah. Get a few people looking at it and see if they're right. Testing motors is a bit voodoo, but get a second opinion, because if you then drag it out, it's not broken, you're again gonna look like a fucking massive penis. Absolutely first thing you're gonna wanna know about the motor is, what kind of motor is it, yeah? A lot of them look like this, but they could be different things, yeah? So I'm gonna cater for 95% of motors. Three phase squirrel cage motors, wired in star or delta, that are basically allowed to be wired in star or delta or star delta. So you'll end up with something like this, yeah? You'll have some three phase in earth coming out of it, go into an isolator or some such thing. And then below here, 
is what you need to know. So let me take off the cover to this. This is called the terminal box. This is the terminal box lid. I'm going to whip that off and show you what goodness lies beneath because what lies beneath here dictates how the motor is tested because it dictates what kind of motor it is. There's info on the data plate, but I know you're not interested in that, so we're going to take that cover off now and have a nose in it. What you'll see now is the lid's off and I've got these screws. You also, that bean tins appeared, yeah? When you're taking a motor apart, if they're small motors or if they're big motors, they're normally full of little screws and stuff. There's, there's loads of bits going off here. So get some kind of container, put them safe, put them out of the way. Last thing you want to be doing is working on a sewage farm or a cement works that's called with dust or shit, and you knock those screws into a pile of dust or shit, then you're fishing around trying to find them. Then you've exposed the lid. And in here, I will show you the terminal rail and what's going off here. At this point in the process, it is absolutely critical that you carry out this stage here that I'm going to tell you about now. Because if you don't, when you try and put it back together or replace the motor, you'll be in a world of pain. So much that you'll wish you were dead or you'll just walk off a job and cry and never get paid. Let's backtrack a little bit, yeah? This motor is not connected, but obviously you'd have done your safe isolation. This would be going to an isolator that's locked off. The thing to remember with motors is just stopping the power getting to them is not enough. On the shaft, which is round here, this bit, there'll be something connected and that could have stored energy within it. So whatever this is connected to, you need to make sure it's not going to move or twist or ideally disconnect it. So you're left with a motor that's floating in the air, not connected to anything where it could just rip your hand off when it fucking feels like it and have no power inside this bit so you don't get a belt off it. So you've done all that and you've lifted it off, yeah? And inside you'll see that the three phases are connected down the bottom three screws and then across the top three screws, there's little plates in between. That is wired in either star or delta. Now, if you look at the lid over here, look, you'll see, if I get the light right, there's a diagram. So if the plates are going downwards, it's in delta. And if the plates are going across the top, it's in star. So this is a star connected motor. So what you need to do now is, because you're going to be taking this apart, is label or picture or mark up or do a drawing or some sort of record of exactly where the colours go from the mains feed, yeah? How the wines are connected, which will be marked U1, U2, W1, W2. They're all there. I'll show you in a minute, yeah? But you need to make sure you mark where all these are. So you need to mark where the winding cables are, which are these on the side and there's some under there where the phasing cables are, the feed cables are, and where the plates are. Because when you're finished and you want to put it back together and they're gone, you're knackered. Right, at this point now, we've established we've got a six terminal motor that can be winding star or delta. It's a squirrel cage motor, yeah? If it ain't got six terminals in there and it's not winding star or delta, you've got bigger problems because you've got a funny dunny motor, maybe a single phase, maybe a dialander, maybe a double wire motor, something like that. But if it's got six terminals, Star or Delta white windings in the plates or as per the drawing that's in the lid, you're pretty much laughing. So if you've got your date details of how it's wired, the next thing you need to do is inspect the motor to see if there's anything wrong with it before you start. There's no point dragging all these windings out to find the shaft's fucking melted or something like that. Because if, if it's physically broken, it's a replacement anyway. You might want to test the windings, but the motor's got to be changed anyway. So there's no point fucking around checking all the windings to find, like say, the shaft broken or the foot's broken or something like that. So let's just cover a little bit of vision inspection of the motor first. Use all your senses here. Sight, sound, smell. First things first. When you lift this lid off, you're all safely isolated, by the way. If it stinks of burning shit, yeah, it's fucked. If it smells like shit and it looks like shit, it's probably shit. But if it just smells like shit, it's probably shit. When motors burn out, they give off a very, very distinctive smell, which you'll smell in there. At this point, you can pretty much guarantee your windings have gone. However, you don't just stop there because it smells like shit, because some motors do smell like shit, to be honest. They don't smell great, but when you get your first burnt out motor, you'll know what that smell is like. So just continue the inspection. So little whiff around there, see if there's any signs of burn or anything like that. This one looks to be all in good condition. There's nothing going off in there. Has it got a data plate? Because that'll tell you all about the motor, which is good. Look all around the casing for signs of cracks or breaks, yeah, particularly around the feet. This is a foot mount motor. Check the footing's not broken on both sides. Go all the way around it. Check the casing and all that. If it all looks tickety-boo and laughing, try to spin the shaft. Does the shaft spin smoothly and sweetly without making any strange noises? So this one seems okay. And just generally look over. Things that will show on the outside will literally show on the outside. You'll know what's going off. But if you do all that kind of stuff, there's no smell. The shaft moves. There's no cracks or damage to the casing. The end's not bunged up with crap. And the feet are intact. It's bolted down properly. 
you've probably got a problem with your windings which needs to check so we'll move on to that next and this is the bit you'll do for most motors to find out what's wrong with them so i've done a little drawing look i've drawn my terminal block and i've drawn where my windings go into it and wrote the names down on both sides then i've wrote where my phase colors go and lumber them up yeah and also i've drawn my shaft because that way is very different to that way it's totally different so i've already taken my motor by drawing my shaft so now i can take that apart quite happily and not know not get lost basically even though i know exactly how my motor's wired and exactly what that drawing should look like and exactly where the face should go normally i always still do a drawing just in case i get stressed out and wind up i still do a drawing and i've been doing it years i also recently till recently used to use a little socket set for these but these are very fragile screws and i've really got into nut spinners at the minute I've really bought this nice set of mop spinners and these enable me to have great feel of what's going off. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take the cables and the plate. Well, I'm going to undo these nuts first and I'll show you what goes off. Right, so at this point now, I've removed what I call all the top nuts. So if you look on there, look, you'll see all the nuts that were on the cable and the plates have gone. However, there's still a set of nuts holding the winding cables on. And over here, look, I've got all the nuts I've removed and I've kept them all to one side. They not only tin, but I've just laid them all out so you can see them. Notice there are three plates there, not two. And now I've got all my windings available for test, isolated. Now, it's important now that we know how these, these windings work. So if you look in there, you'll notice the U's, the V's and the W's and the colours correspond. But they don't correspond downwards. They correspond across. Let me draw the windings for you. At the moment, the windings look like this. The red's the motor, yeah? There's just three windings sat inside it, not doing anything. Both ends are open-ended, like on that diagram. They are terminated. There, look. Up, through the winding, and down to this one. You'll notice that they stagger across. That one goes to there. That one goes to there. And that one goes to there, but it's actually here. So note that the windings are staggered on the terminals. That's very important. But just inside the motor, like this, like I said, there's three windings. And they are isolated from each other, just plonked into terminals which means we can do the test we want to do. Essentially now, we're looking for probably one of four faults. Let me go over what those faults are. One of them is a short between windings, which could look like that. So it might be between a winding and another winding, or all three of the windings. But effectively, these isolated windings have become connected together. There's a test we'll do for that as part of the sequence. So that is a short between the windings. The next one is a shorting across the windings because the insulation breaks down. So that could look like that. Yeah, or it could just be between those points there or all of that or a little bit of that or all of that. And that is when a winding shorts out itself with itself. So the winding becomes shorter than it is and ceases to be the winding it's designed to be to run the motor. There's a test we'll do to find that. Next one, obviously, you can get this one yourself, is a short to earth. That's where a winding, at any point on the winding, ends up shorting down to earth, usually the casing of the motor itself, and there's a visible, identifiable even, short between the winding itself down to earth, the casing. That as a test for it. The last fault you can probably find is this one, which has naturally happened because I've been messing around the drawer and rubbing things on and putting things off. That is broken windings. That is when at some point, maybe on the legs of the windings or the wind itself becomes broken. Therefore, the winding ceases to be a circuit. It's just two ends of copper shown by the brakes here. So that is another one you can get. And you can, again, there's a test for that. The test that we do, look for all these problems. The problem is this. This is the important bit. If I'm running a load of electricians who are doing fault finding or FM or repairs on machinery, yeah, and one of them keeps coming to me and saying, yeah, that motor's knackered, I've changed it. Okay, fair enough. What was wrong with it? The motor was knackered. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, but that's just not good enough, yeah? Swapping out 300-pound motors willy-nilly soon starts costing a lot of money. So when you go to somewhere and you've got a faulty motor, you need to be able to, able to identify what was wrong with it which one of those faults it was and on what phase it was on. You'd ideally log that. So you come in and go, oh, phase L1 was down to earth. So it maybe indicates a bad winding. You might have had a motor go absolutely shit itself and you've got 
all the phases melt together and down to earth. So you can have combinations of those faults on top of one another like that. But when I have a motor that someone's told me is faulty, I want to know what was wrong with it and what the test showed because they're expensive. Little motors like this get replaced. Big motors get re rewound, rewound, we, 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 bone selector, rewound. Should I do that again? No, I won't. Yeah, little motors like this get replaced, but big motors get rewound. So if it's been off for a rewind and then you get one of these faults, you probably want to know what it is because you might have got a problem inherently with the motor. You might have the same phase going down. If you keep putting new motors in, that might indicate a problem with the control circuit or something wrong. So when you are replacing any parts, you need to identify the problem, work out what the problem was and what parts had failed, log that and then change the part. Then if it happens again, you can build up a thing that it's happening all the time or you can say, well, that worked. Motors do break, but it's always good to look out for ongoing problems. And as well as this test, there's loads of other tests you can do if you want to go into in this series. But this one is the Billy Basics for finding motors, yeah? The person who's replacing the motor wants to know what was wrong with it. Like all testing, like um, ERCRs and stuff like that and, and initial verification on that, the testing needs to be done in the right order. Because if you don't do it in the right order, you won't, you'll get false positives and you won't prove things. For example, the first test you need to do is check the ends of the, check the, these are intact, the wires are intact from end to end. Because if you just start megaring them and it's broken, that might mega clear, but there might be a fault over here. So let me draw that. So for example, if that was down to earth and you put your probe on here and the earth, your meter would not show a fault. It wouldn't show this earth fault because the wine is broken. So just be aware of that. So now we'll go through the tests in the correct sequence so you can diagnose which one of those four problems or which multiple of those four problems you've got a problem with in your motor. And then I have to wait for the time to end on Instagram. So I'll just talk like this. Right then, I'm going to pause for a little minute because this is, I'm recording this on Instagram. If you're watching on YouTube, there'll be a gap here. But what I'm saying is, I'm going to pause for a minute and just review what I've done and check it's right. You should do the same too. Don't progress past this stage unless you're happy that you know what the four fault conditions could be because otherwise you're wasting your time going any further. Make sure you understand how your windings are wired and how you separate all your windings by dismantling your motor and how you store your stuff correctly. Yeah? There's no point going on to a testing that we're going to do next if you're not comfortable with what we've just been over. So if you have to re-watch it, yeah, pump my numbers up, bitches, and you have to draw the pictures out and do all the faults on your own, do that. There's four faults, there's three windings, there's earth in play, there's all the nuts and bolts, there's the motor and everything, yeah? There's the winding numbers. Make sure you're happy with that. Otherwise, what I'm going to do next is just sound like I'm speaking a foreign language. Yeah, make sure you're comfortable because when we move on to the testing, which we're going to do next, the actual getting the tester out testing, we're going to be referring to the drawings and the faults we've done. I'm not going to keep drawing it and drawing it. I'm going to be back referencing what I've already covered. I've covered all of this thing now because now at this minute time, we've got all the information there, as long as you remember it, to test and diagnose a motor fault or more, multiple motor faults. Also, I'm nipping out to Greg's if you're watching this on Instagram, so don't hold your breath. Right then, let's get this testing done, because this is the meat of it. We've done all the other stuff, and now I need to go into the actual testing bit. So I've got my motor, yeah? I've got my drawing so I can visualise what the motor currently looks like. It's just three windings inside a box, inside a circle. And I've got some test gear. Let me show you what test gear I'll be using for this. Currently, my go-to equipment for motor testing is this Chevronu F607, which is a massively pimp meter. You don't need one of those just yet, calm down kids, but this one I'll be using the ohms on it for the low reading ohmmeter. And I've got this CA6524, which is um, it's an insulation resistance tester. Now you're probably thinking I've got one of them, you have. You've got one of them on your MFT. That goes up to mega ohms. The thing with this one is it goes up to giga ohms. These go to 11. For a very, very long time, I was happy with Mega Ohms. Yeah, I had an insulation resistance tester as part of BMFT, and it went up to Mega Ohms. And then when I started doing some serious motor testing, I realised that I needed Gig Ohms, because it's a fucking big jump. So yeah, when you're doing the Gig Ohms, let me show you why the Mega Ohms is a problem. 
I've done this graph, yeah? Obviously, on the bottom, you've got time. And up here, you've got the ohms, the kilo ohms, the mega ohms, and the giga ohms, yeah? And then it looks like an R. The problem is, there's the motor slowly dying, yeah? And when it's new, it doesn't die very much. And it slowly, slowly, slowly starts to die, and it starts to die and starts to die. But what I've shown is there, look, that proportion there, above the between the green lines here, that's the gig ohm. So you can, if you measured it in gig ohms every month or every year, you'd see it slowly dying. But when you've got a mega ohm tester, you don't get to see that bit. You get to see this bit. So by the time your mega ohm tester's picking up a problem, your motor's on its way out, and it's a rapid decline to death. Obviously, if you're testing motors that are around this area, that's fine. But the gig ohms let you see more in advance. It lets you see from the start of the motor all throughout its life, and then obviously the mega ohms only lets you see for the last little bit of its life. I hope that's a good explanation. Yeah, I think it is. What's all you getting? So yeah, with the mega ohms, you, you get a smaller window into the failure of the motor. With giga ohms, you get a lot more data to play with. And obviously, data is absolutely king nowadays. So that's why I've now gone on to a gig ohm reading ohm meter. Which is basically the lowest level you want for professionally fault finding motors. But if you've got a mega meter, that's going to be fine for fault finding. You don't need a gigometer. Mega ohms will be fine for proving a problem because there's something there to find that's easy. You're in that window already. This is when you want to check motors and say, yeah. And you want to, uh, um, you want to log their, their fucking up, basically. Right then, we start the testing and we want to test the windings. Now, this may confuse you, but remember, we've got this drawing. Blue represents the U. Purple represents the V, orange represents the W. So we're going here, look, and we'll find the U's first. They're the red ones, U1 to U2. That is this part to this part. So let's check that winding across its own length by applying a lone read no meter, which is called an overload, to U1 to U2. Null in my leads are, meters reading zero. It's forced to flash the battery light up. I hope that doesn't go second new batteries down here. Fuck! I could use this one for this as well, but it's, this one's got one decimal place. So I've connected to each end lot. You can see there, that's a good shot. I've connected uh, U1 to U2, which is either end of the winding, which is basically here to here. And I'm getting 45.5 ohms. I'm now going to record that on my drawing. I've recorded that value on my drawing. I'm now going to come back to my motor. I'm going to move along to my V winding. So let's move these onto the V winding and check that winding. There you go, look, I've moved on to my V windings and I've got 45.5, which is not dissimilar to that one. So let me record that on my uh, drawing. And finally, I'll move on to my W windings, which I've already done. They're the ones that are staggered, look, so I'm at each end like that. Sorry about the focusing. And I've got 45.5, so let me record that on my drawing. So all the windings have been checked from end to end. There's a clean shot of them without the crocodile clips on, yeah? You might not have the numbers on them. They might be coloured or they might be wrong. So if you have to bell them out and check them and make sure your wind is staggered across going dirt, 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 there to there and then that to the end. And then I've recorded it on here. So as you can see, my UVW windings are all 45.5 ohms, which means they're good. This is quite a new motor and it's hardly been used if it has been used at all. So I'd expect them to be really bang on, maybe a point out. If you've got more than two to 5% out, I'd start getting worried. You've probably got a problem. You might get away with it, you might not. But writing it down like that and be able to visually look at it and go, yeah, look, they're all about the same winding resistance, which is what you would expect from a new motor's windings. And we've basically proved that that goes to there, that goes to there, and that goes to there. Now what I like to check is that there's no fault to earth and there's no interwinding issues. Now, I like to stop on ohms for this. I don't like to get spicy to apply the mega ohms. I just like to do a basic test with this. So I clip it onto the earth, yeah? And I clip that onto the earth. It's beeping, this continuity here. Then I just go U1. There's nothing. V1. There's nothing. And W1. There's nothing. So that tells me at that end, it's not connected to earth. Then I do the other end. All three of them, one, not connected, that's not connected, and that's not connected. So at the moment, on low ohms, none of those windings from either end are connected to earth. It takes a couple of seconds to do it, why not? Then, before I get spicy with a, with a mega, I like to just do a continuity check, we're not interconnected, so I go, the first two together, they're not connected. The end ones, they're not connected. And the last two, they're not connected. It takes seconds. I'll just do it on the other side as well. The two M1s, 
sorry, the two far ones, the two end ones, and the two next to each other. That's it. It just takes a few seconds to do it before you start megging it to prove this is a fault in there anyway that will pick up on this test. Just be aware, not everyone does that test. Not everyone teaches that test. It's just something I like to do to prove... Stop beeping, meter. I'll turn you off. I like to just prove that each end of the windings is not connected to Earth and each end of the windings is not connected to each other because if you've got a little fault, it'll just show up there anyway, but you need to get spicy with the mega to prove it. But let me just show you what I've done. I just checked that to Earth, that to Earth, that to Earth. That to earth, that to earth, that to earth. That they weren't connected, that they weren't connected, and that they weren't connected. That they weren't connected, that they weren't connected, and that they weren't connected. Just like to do it on homes, I do. Why not? You're there anyway. It doesn't... It's not really a proper test, but I'd just like to know that there's nothing going on before I start advancing. So that's what I do. You can skip that if you want to do the end-to-end -end on this part, but I like to do that because I like to have all the data available to me off my motor. Obviously, the end-to-end -end windings is done with a low reading ohmmeter. The rest of the tests I did there should be done with a mega, but like I say, before I get spicy with my 500 and 1,000 volts, just like to have a little check with the, with the ohmmeter, any obvious things will just plough out with that test and you don't need to continue. So now we're gonna get the spicy voltages involved and what we're gonna do is, we've done the end-to-ends and we've recorded that value. We'll keep that value, so that's useful. Now we're going to do the voltage, uh, do an insulation resistance test between each winding and the metal case. Because with the spicy voltage of the uh, 500 volts, if there's a little tiny nick in the insulation, the voltage will get out past that and show you a bad reading, especially on the gig ohm setting. Or if it's got moisture in it, you'll get a result on that. Like I say, you want your end-to-ends and your mega ohms. The reason I had in little spicy tests, another little test, is because uh, I've played this game on site for real. And I know the problems you can get. You can get dirt and grit in motors, grease, water, all throwing your readings off and getting really weird readings. Your readings might not be stable. They might be fluctuating all over the place, in which case you've probably got water. But yeah, let's now do the uh, insulation resistance test of the windings. We're going to set 500 volts on the meter and, and show you how that's done. And I will do it from each end of the windings as well. Just because I've got the lid off, I may as fucking well I don't want to take it off again. I've moved the gear back. So what I've done now is I've got one of the leads connected onto the earth, I've just got the other lead on the bench. And over here, I've got my insulation resistance tester. I'm just gonna go, I'm gonna put the light on for a start so you can see it better. I'm just gonna go for a test. And it's doing the test now, it's pumping the voltage through. I think you have to press and hold this. There we go. Going through the mega ohms range lock. Let's go through the gig ohms range. And amazingly, it's picking something up which it weren't doing 10 seconds ago because it's measuring 19.19 gig ohms. It's measuring that through the fucking bench, I think. Um, and it's maintained its 551 volts. Lot. But yeah, let's even get this. It's got, it's picking something up. So between that motor and that crocodile clip, there's a measurable resistance of 18 gig ohms. Let me just move the crocodile clip into free air. Schoolboy error, my leads were twisted together. When I removed the leads, I got a high reading. Now, I'm going to place all this lead over air lock and press this button. I'm leaning on the desk at the minute. And it's currently reading 14 gig ohms. Let me lift my elbows and my stomach off the desk. And it's still got about 15.24 gig ohms, yeah? Let's pull that lead out of the meter. Took the lead out so there's nothing in the top lock. Now I'm going to press it. I'm getting over 100 gig ohms. So... If I leave my leads touching the desk, I'll I'll influence my reading, basically, because that's what gig ohms do. Prove that. Plug that back in there, lock, and do a test now. It's picking stuff up. That's the madness you're dealing with. But it's so far into the gig ohms range, it doesn't matter. So I'll leave my leads lying on the bench. But just be aware that does happen. Yeah. Um, news to me, that one is now 20 gig ohms between those things. If we move that cable and fits less. Yeah, it's gone up, look. So, anyway, bonkers gig ohms. Giga ohms are mental. Anyway, I've put it on the motor lock and I've started off. I'll start on the first winding. Well, the, the, I'll start on the U winding there. Click that on. Obviously, keep your leads in free if you're doing a proper test, but I haven't got that. Doing the test between those two points. Doing the mega ohms, 
and that is 13.9 gig ohms. Let's just press hold it and get the live read in. It's rising. Look, there's, there's at least 15 gig ohms. It's greater than 15, 16, 17 gig ohms. Let's move the winding across. On to the next winding. There it goes, it's going for its mega ohms and it's gone to the gig ohms and now that's greater than it's climbing and it'll climb for ages because there's another test you can do which I'm going to explain later but yeah, that is over or it's going to be over but time to let go of the button, 12 gig ohms and we're on to the final one and I'll try and keep both in shot here if I can and do that there we go, it's going through the mega ohms I ain't held the button because I'm an idiot and it's a live test that's also over 12 gig ohms. So those windings are not connected to earth in any worrying way. So now we've tested the windings to earth. I've recorded that. I've adjusted my chart slightly. So I've now put my winding resistances here, look, to show them. And on my chart, I've recorded greater than 12 on the U. It was greater than 17 on the V. And it was greater than 12 on the W. Now we're going to do this bit. So I'll take you sideways, look. And I'm going to test the gig ohms between the windings. To do this, you do the outsides, the lefts and the rights. That gives you every possible combination, as you'll see on here now. I'll come over here and do it. So I've just so we can see a bit better. You'll see I've set the probes on the outside windings. Put the back light on and do the test. It's going through the mega ohms. And between those outer windings, we are getting... I'm not holding it all day, but we're getting... Basically, we're going to get greater than 50 gigs, are we? Let's let it roll into that. Yeah, greater than 50 gigs. That'll do me. Nothing to write home about. Then I'll change it to the that side of the windings. Is our RRs, remember it? Do the test again. It's gone through the mega ohms piece, piece. There it is rapidly winding. It's going to be over 50 again. I'm going to stop the test because I ain't got all day. Need review. E yeah, over 50 gigs will do me. Then we'll do the windings on this side, thus completing the all the windings to each other. And we're rocking and rolling. Look, you see the meter running there. I'm trying to get you a feel for doing the test. I don't like to leave big gaps, but I'm trying to give you a feel for doing the test. And as you can see, that's rolled over 50, which is adequate for me. So the question is now is, is this motor serviceable? So, is the motor any good? Well, as you can see from the results we've got and wrote on this drawing, so we can visually see them all in one place, yeah? The windings are equal, which is great. When you've got them equal, it's a good sign. And you'd imagine that they're not going to be all, be, all fail to that level at the same time. So, equal windings is always a good look. If you've got any variance between 2 and 3%, you've probably got a problem. So the windings look good, and they're obviously connect from there to there, so they're not broken. We have any broken windings or shorted out windings on themselves. Then, when we go to the insulation resistance testers between the windings and earth, you'll see that they're over 12, over 17 is left, that one go a bit longer, and over 12 again. So again, you can throw a blanket over them really, they're nice and equal. Then when we look over there, look at the interwinding ones, you'll see there's a nice number of 50 gig ohms between each winding, or greater than 50 gig ohms. That's a massive figure, so... The thing you're looking for is consistency. This test consistent, this test consistent, this test consistent. This test consistent. If one of these numbers was a little bit out or quite a way out, you'd be looking at a problem. But I would say that this motor and the results that I've logged here, because this can stay forever, is serviceable. It's a good bit of kit because everything's there or thereabouts and nothing's too low. Is this motor serviceable? Yes, yes it is. Because the windings are separate from the earth case. The windings are intact, the windings are not shorted down, and the windings are not connected to earth, the windings aren't connected to each other. This is a serviceable motor. I'll just briefly talk about the gig ohms there and go back to that test, because that will lead on something I'm going to cover later on. But basically, that's the test. The end-to-end -end windings and the mega ohms on it has proven it's a good motor. So hopefully that makes sense to you, but I'm just going to show you something else you can do to a motor that I'm going to cover in a later video. 
dealing with little motors like this, no one really cares, but there are bigger motors that are more important than this motor, yeah, that need checking. And there's two types of tests you can do on them. One of them is a PI test, and one of them is a DAR test. And a DAR test is a prolonged insulation resistance test. I'm not going to cover it in this video, but just be aware there are PI testing and DAR testing. And just to give you an example, because it's a prolonged test, if I stop on that winding now, and I press that button... I basically do a manual dart test by pressing this button, and a manual dart test is for minutes. This meter is capable of doing it, I'm going to work out how it works and does it, but basically, as long as I can talk, and I'll try and talk till the end of this fucking one minute on this Instagram video, yeah, that is going to keep rising and rising and rising, because electronic scientific things are happening within the motor, electrons are lying, all that kind of gubbins, yeah, which means the reading will just keep rising, even if it is slowly. So to get an absolute settled reading on that giga ohms will take... 10 minutes. This test is the kind of test you would perform if you wanted to know how well your motor is doing the service and when the likely replacement date is. So as you can see, it's still climbing. I'm not going to stand in on my finger up for 10 minutes, but I'm going to cover this in a separate video. But yeah, this is what you want when you want to prove things properly. Oh, it's settling though, isn't it? It's settling around 12 gigs. So maybe it'd finish around there, but there might be a little bit more to get out of it. That test I was just doing is how you get your readings in this zone. Is how you get these readings, yeah? So you go, motor's here, motor's here, motor's here, motor's here. And at this point, you start to go, you know what? That motor's starting to fail. We need to keep an eye on it. And when you do the test here, you go, that motor's really starting to fail now. And next time you come back, it's crashed down to here. So that DAR test is how you predict the demise of your motor and have a new motor ready before your motor blows up and you lose a critical application like, I don't know, a water pumping station or something like that. Now, I appreciate that was a very, very long video and we didn't actually spend that long with testing. And to me, that's that's the whole point, is the results are just results, they're just numbers, but knowing what's going off in your drawing and knowing what's going off inside the motor and using those results that you get very quickly and thinking how they react to that drawing and what the actual internal things are going off inside the motor is the secret sauce, yeah? The testing is just put some pros and pressing the button. Knowing what's happening inside is a secret source. So if you're struggling with that, watch it again. Hopefully, you'll be able to get your hands on a motor and do some testing of your own. Hopefully, you'll be able to get your hands on a broken motor to test your own because that's what really sets it off. And I've done a test on this. I've only got a working motor, but when the readings don't feel right, that's when you've got a problem. So hopefully, that's helped. If you've got any questions, I'll put a box up here in a minute so you can do it more. If it's YouTube, you can put them in the comments. This isn't the last motor video I'm going to do with this motor and this tester. I'm going to go on to DAR testing. I'm going to go on about motor nameplates and footings and all the different things about motor. But for today, that is it. So that was a fucking lie. That's not it. Why are you lying? What I'm saying is, is it's very quick to do a test. But the experience and the use of the numbers in relation to the motor are the important bit. When you tell someone to change a motor that's this big, might not be a massive problem. When you tell someone to change a motor that's the size of a Ford Fiesta, that is a problem. So... Get your head round the numbers, get your head round the maths, get your head round the warnings and your earths and all that, because that is how you are going to save yourself a lot of money by not swapping something that does not need swapping. So yeah, any questions, the box will be up next. Let me know and I'll try and answer them. Might be in a video format. And if you've made it through this, well done. You are my hero. Slapping the tester on takes seconds. Knowing how to interpret the results can take a couple of weeks to years. It depends, all depends on how big this is and how twitchy your bum gets. Don't worry, I'm going to cover the plates, the screws, fitting the motor, star delta, all that. It's all coming. But today, frankly, I've got the windows shut so I've been always looking from outside and I'm sweating my tits off and I'm adding off. Where is this summer day come from? But yeah, I'll be covering it all. So, um, yeah, if you, want to, if you particularly want to see something, let me know. But I'll be covering all the things about the motors over the next few months because I'm sort of interjecting with other videos and doing stuff like that. Go on then, fuck off. Fuck off. <laughs>